Hello, everyone. <laughs> Shall I launch? We're ready. This is so exciting. Well, thank you so much for coming. I'm Jackie Klopp, and I'm at Columbia's Climate School. And I am very excited to have um, Pete Malinowski here from the Billion o Oyster Project, which is a project that I think extremely highly of and think is extremely exciting. So um, without further ado, let's chat. OK. So first of all, Pete, um, what, tell us about the Billion Oyster Project. Like, what is it about? Why does it matter? Um, so we're, we're a, a small nonprofit located on Governor's Island, about 43 full-time staff. And our, our mission is to restore oyster reefs to New York Harbor through public education initiatives. So it's all about restoring the ecology of the harbor, restoring the native landscape that used to exist here, and doing it in a way that engages young people and trains young people in sort of the skills of the hard skills of oyster restoration, the, um, the students learning marine careers. So they're learning how to scuba dive, drive boats, conduct research, do policy work, all by, you know, all with the end goal of restoring oysters to New York Harbor. So there's a wonderful book called The, the Big, Big Oyster that talks about the role of the oyster in New York City and that it was an enormous sort of cultural phenomena and also a huge business in the early uh, times of, you know, the city being built. Um, what happened to the oyster, and why is it so important now to rebuild these oyster reefs? Yeah, so we ate them. We ate all the oysters, <laughs> which, is a, which is a global issue. So 95% of oyster reefs globally have been eaten by humans. And the, you know, the, a lot of that happened far enough in the past that we don't remember what things used to look like. Uh, but it's important for all of you to know, as you're spending some time in New York City, that this place used to be one of the great ecosystems of the world. So the, you know, the Hudson River, the Upper New York Bay, the East River, Western Long Island Sound is an estuary that used to be totally teeming with life. So when Europeans first arrived, they described being able to catch fish just by lowering a basket over the side of the boat and not being able to see the sky for minutes at a time because there were so many birds. And they wrote home and said, we'll never need to go to Sweden again for stockfish. There's more fish here than we could ever possibly eat. And the backbone of that ecosystem was oyster reefs, hundreds of thousands of acres of reef. And so, you, I mean, you, we, we think of natural places. We think of you know, Yellowstone National Park or something like that. But we're sitting in one of, the, one of those great natural places, and it still has all the hydrological and geological features that allow for that abundance. It's just missing its habitat, missing that landscape that provides food and habitat for different animals, filters the water, stabilize the bottom. So essentially, we are 30 million people living, living around a 200,000 acre forest that's had all the trees removed. So that's how you got to think of the harbors, flat, featureless landscape that used to have this three-dimensional habitat. And that's just the sort of ecological importance of the oysters, but it also was a cultural thing. You could get oysters at carts all over the city. You know, for a penny, for a penny, you get half a dozen oysters, and they're enjoyed by rich and poor alike. And people traveled from all over the world to eat New York Harbor oysters, and they're known as a delicacy. Um, but we ate them all. So, so we destroyed that business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was very important because we weren't thinking about sustainability. Um, yeah, which is hard. Um, I think the other thing was the pollution, right? We this is a huge industrial. This was a huge industrial city with a very active harbor. So I guess we ate them, and then we also, the remaining, we yep. probably yeah, ate so their it, habitat. It, it's really fascinating. The ecological history of New York is incredibly fascinating. But the, the population of the city was limited in its growth by access to fresh water. So we drank all the wells, and the, city, the, the growth of the city stagnated until we made the aqueducts to bring fresh water down from the Catskills. And that allowed the population of the city to explode right around the time we were running out of all the oysters. And so what happened is with access to fresh water, there's, you know, uh, we got indoor plumbing, and New Yorkers drank as much water, flushed as many toilets, and washed as many dishes as they wanted, and all of that went right out into the harbor. And so the late 1800s, the early 1900s, it is the, the sort of industrial pollutants are part of it, but the biggest issue is sewage. So the harbor was just totally filled with 
untreated household wastewater, however you want to, whatever term you want to use to describe it. But the, uh, but that, um, and the um, oyster, the last remaining oyster reefs, which at that point were actually farms. There, we had eaten all the wild oysters and started farming oysters. And they got shut down in the early 1900s came, because it came as a huge surprise to New Yorkers that pouring raw sewage on your food supply was a problem. People started getting sick, and they shut down the oyster beds for that reason. So now you're going to try to bring them back and explain to us that task and why is it important. And maybe since we have some, you know, hard-nosed folks here, like what can the oyster do for us here in New York City now? Yeah. Um, well, the uh, how we do it, it's it's sort of complicated, but the, basically we grow oysters on Governor's Island. We build these steel cages that we put recycled restaurant shell in. So we operate a shell collection program at restaurants. We attach live oysters to them in a laboratory environment, and then we we install those reef structures throughout the harbor. Everywhere from the Tappan Zee Bridge, the JFK Airport, to the Bronx River, um, East River along the Brooklyn shoreline, um, into Raritan Bay by the southern end of Staten Island, sort of all over the place. And the, uh, the goal is to build back, you know, increase the population to the point where it can grow and grow on its own. So we, so we have an, a sustainable oyster population back in the harbor. And um, that is a, and what, so the question is what can, hard-nosed people makes me think you're looking to poke holes in my plan. But the, uh, <laughs> but the I guess it's like, what can you do to help? I mean, the, the biggest, um, you know, a big part of our challenge is that New Yorkers, people who live in New York City, don't identify typically as living in a port city or living on the water. And um, the reality is that most streets in New York end at the water's edge. We have almost 600 miles of coastline here, here in, in town. And the, what we're hoping to do is through this work, not only restore the ecology of the harbor, but also turn New York back to the harbor. Think of living in New York City as living in a place that's surrounded by an important natural ecosystem that is worthy of, of our care and protection. And, and you know, there's, there's sort of endless opportunities for recreation and education just here in the city. And so what you can do, there's a million ways to help directly, but also more, maybe more importantly, is one, tell your friends that you know, New York Harbor is a cool, important natural resource, and go enjoy it. So the, I get, I'm very lucky to spend a lot of time on the water in New York City, and I've seen dolphins, I've seen whales, I've seen seahorses, I've seen giant flocks of northern gannets, uh, um, northern skimmers, which are one of the coolest birds you'll ever see, kingfishers, ibises, great blue herons, um, there's one spot in the Arthur Kill between Staten Island and New Jersey where you can see a dozen osprey nests from one place. And I know all summer long I can go there at sunrise and watch ospreys pick fish out of the water, which is something that people would travel thousands of miles to see. And you can see that right here in New York City. So it's about changing perception and actually taking the time to sort of explore nature here, here in town. So just to be clear, the oyster filters uh, pollutants from the water, and that helps, I think, with the, like all these other species being able to thrive, so it cleans our water. And then I think some of you know about Sandy and, you know, the, the, the dangers um, that we face because of climate change, the, you know, massive storm surge that we, uh, we have experienced, we're going to experience again. It costs billions of dollars of damage, um, and also, obviously, huge human suffering and tragedy and loss, including loss of life. How can this, the oyster reefs help us uh, to protect um, our city and our region that we love, including the harbor? Yes, yeah, so that's another um, time it's useful to look back in time. So the, you, you can look at the sediment record in Staten Island and other places in New York City, and you can see a signal from every major storm event that's happened in the last couple hundred years. And what happens is that when there's major storm events, sediment that's normally on the bottom of, uh, under the water gets pushed up onto land. That's because big waves and the storm surge are crashing onto land and bringing that sediment up onto land. That signal stops 400 years ago. So when, when, the, when the harbor was filled with oyster reefs, the harbor was much calmer and storm events and things like that, the oyster reefs act as natural wave, wave breaks. And so the, the wave energy is, uh, you know, the waves crash before they reach shore, and the energy is greatly diminished. 
And so if you look back at that sediment record, you can see the impact of a harbor full of oyster reefs. Now, getting to that point will take a lot more than a billion oysters, you know, many orders of magnitude more. But there are sort of strategic solutions in certain places. We're working on a, a project called the Living Breakwaters Project in, um, in Raritan Bay, just off of Staten Island, where we're, we're installing oysters along with um, sort of rock jetties to protect the shore. And so there are strategic places where you can protect uh, some portions of New York City using nature-based solutions. And oyster reefs are something that historically did that and can play that role in the future also. Yeah, that's really um, amazing work. I am uh, wondering how you involve so many different actors. So I know we have uh, business students here and interested in social enterprises. And I know you work closely with businesses in, in different ways. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about how you engage with different businesses in your project? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're a nonprofit, so we rely on uh, um, fundraising in all various forms to keep our lights on and make payroll and do all of that. Um, and one of our sources of revenue, which is also um, a, you know, a key element of our programs is our volunteer, volunteer programs. And we do have corporate volunteer programs, so we offer, so um, corporations all over the city will come out for a day of service and bring their teams out to Governor's Island as, like a, as, a, as a bonding activity for them and as a way to give back. And we host those, and there's a cost associated with them. So that's one way that we're able to support that aspect of our work. And then from a branding perspective, we actually have a lot of visibility. And, and the profile of Billion Oyster Project has grown over the last 10 years. And so there is some, um, I'm trying to think of how to explain this. But a good example is our shell collection program is funded entirely by Talisker single, single malt scotch. <laughs> and the, and the, reason that, <laughs> the, the, the reason that works for Talisker is because they get to put their logo on the side of a truck driving around New York City every day picking up oyster shells. So, and, and they're all about clean water. And their one for the sea campaign is, you know, is a, is a way that they're giving back, and they're doing that by supporting our shell collection program. But it also helps them from a business sense because they're allowing them to get more exposure to associate their brand with clean water and with environmental restoration. And so there's some syn synergies there. Sorry. And you told me the sourcing. You have to source the live oysters from elsewhere. So you must also be supporting some businesses somewhere that are. Yeah. You know, that are sourcing this project. Yeah, oysters are expensive, even when they're really small. So the, um, we grow, we have an oyster hatchery. O oysters are like butterflies. They have two life, you know, there's a dramatic change in morphology from larvae to juvenile oysters. And they swim around for two weeks. We grow oyster larvae in a hatchery on Governor's Island. We can produce from between 5 and 25 million oysters per year there. But we use between you know 150 and 250 million oyster larvae per year, and we buy those from hatcheries in in New York and in Maine, and that's actually uh, they cost a thousand dollars a million, so we spend anywhere from 150 to 250 thousand dollars a year just on tiny oysters, and at that a 10 million oyster is about the size of a tennis ball. When they're that that stage, so that's a ten thousand dollar tennis ball. So it's really interesting to see the kinds of businesses and jobs that you know you are supporting by doing this really critical ecosystem reconstruction, which is a element that um, you know sometimes gets neglected. Um, that there could be other kinds of businesses that could emerge to, to really help us protect <laughs> our coastal communities and uh, you know our our environment. Um, so I think. Uh, I think that's uh, kind of an interesting element. Um, and we need to do a lot more of this, obviously. I am curious uh, about your personal journey. Uh, if you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and you know, how you ended up doing this work. Um, I'm, there may be people in the audience who would love to be doing the kind of thing you're doing. Well, it all started up here at the Senior Leadership Program, for, oh, <laughs> led by Matt Hardy, who's in our, <laughs> But the, uh, that, that, that was a cool inflection point. And my journey was, was actually going to that, that, that program here at Columbia. But the, uh, I, I grew up on an oyster farm. I've been, oyster farm, been involved with oysters my entire life. Um, in the, uh, when I was a, a student in high school, I was not a particularly successful student. And I really did not like the school parts of school. Um, and 
one, and at that time I was also working on the oyster farm on weekends after school, all summer vacation, all my vacations, and the, so I was sort of, you know, a, barely a C student in my biology class, but at the same time I was, you know, identifying different pathogens that were affecting oyster larvae in the hatchery and like determining cell densities of al algal cultures and doing, running these experiments with my dad trying to figure out like what worked and what didn't. And that was incredibly exciting to me and really in the, like the learning curve is so steep when you're act like actively trying to learn something. Um, and so when I moved to New York after college, I was trying to get into teaching I think some teachers go into teaching because they're very successful students and they like that aspect of teaching. And some teachers go into teaching because the way their relationship with education was not a positive one. And so they're trying to like change that. So it was just, I don't know if that's necessarily a good idea, but that was, the, uh, that was sort of my motivation for getting into teaching. But then I met the founder of New York Harbor School, which is a public high school. It's a career and technical education school located in the city to train students for marine careers. And they had this amazing program. Um, the Harbor School had replaced the, uh, it was one of four schools that took the spot of the of Bushwick High School, which had a less than 20% four-year graduation rate before Harbor School and the other three schools started there. And, um, and to provide a connection between public school students and the real in-demand careers, well-paying um, waterfront careers that exist in, in the city for marine engineers, boat captains, and, and all of that. And Murray Fisher, who founded Harbor School, had done this amazing thing by starting a public school, but he was frustrated that the students had no way to make their classroom better, New York Harbor being the biggest classroom. And so we, the first time we met, the first thing we talked about was can we use oyster restoration as a way to bring all of these different career training classes together and also make New York Harbor a cleaner, more abundant place. And that resonated really strongly with me because it was a way to, to do this active, hands-on experiential learning towards a, a, um, an ambitious and you know, really interesting final outcome. And so we just started doing that. So I, I became a teacher at Harbor School. I started the aquaculture program there. We started restoring oysters, and that was in 2008. And then in 2014, we launched Billion Oyster Project originally named Billion Oysters NYC, which we stole from Million Trees NYC, mm. and pitched the Bloomberg administration as the next great public-private partnership to restore the largest open space in New York City. But it turns out oysters are a little harder to understand than trees and not quite, didn't have quite the same property value, the like one-to-one -one property value valuation that trees did. So we never got our $100 million from the city, and instead we launched Billion Oyster Project as a nonprofit. I was wondering why a billion. You were trying to impress Bloomberg. You have million trees, billion oysters. That was certainly part of it. Um, <laughs> no, I mean it's true. I mean the uh, we've gotten a lot of mileage from our brand, and the the um, there's a couple reasons for a billion. One is that the, a billion live oysters would filter the standing volume volume of Upper New York Bay every three days. Um, so that's like a neat fact. It's not, um, in reality, that's not how it would work because if you take 20 years to restore uh, an organism that lives for five or six years, most of them are dead by the time you get to, by, by the time you finish. Um, but the, uh, and the water moves through New York. So the, every day you have all new water. So you can't, even if you filled New York Harbor with oysters, you wouldn't, that wouldn't solve the problem. That, that wouldn't solve, the, the water quality problem would still be a problem as long as you're pouring sewage into the harbor, there will always be sewage in the harbor. And so the, the oysters act as a, you know, both to, they do play a role in cleaning the water. I would argue that they're, they're, the, the role for supporting other animals is actually more valuable ecologically. They can, one acre of restored oyster reef habitat can support 90 million more animals than an adjacent acre without those oyster reefs on it. And the, um, but the billion, the biggest, uh, most important thing with a billion as a number is that it is an ambitious target that is possible to reach, but it's going to be very hard and we're going to need everyone's help to do it. And so the idea of setting that sort of really high goal and um, using that as a, as a rallying cry is a, that's the main reason for the billion. It also sounds cool. It totally sounds cool. And it allows you to make these, you know, yeah, like really cool logo. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's very cool. And uh, I don't know how aware people are that we have a species extinction crisis. I think there's a lot of discussion about climate and the storm surge, but um, you know, we're, we're just having accelerating destruction of our ecosystems, and that has huge implications. You can even tie it to the continued uh, increase of diseases that are linked to our interaction with wildlife. So uh, even, you know, arguably COVID comes out of that, um, you know, from our interaction potentially with bats and <laughs> how that transmits into humans. Um, so I, I think it's just so important. I, I'm sorry, I'm being like, I'm putting on my professor hat, but the biodiversity crisis is, is, is extremely severe with huge implications for us. So, you know, this, Restoring these ecosystems and allowing other species to thrive is really important for our own health. Um, it's not just that they're really cool, which they are, but it's for our, our own well-being. So it's just so, so important. Um, and on that sort of note, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what are your challenges? You've got these really brilliant young people here um, who want to do, you know, use capital for good. And I'm wondering, like, what are can we brainstorm a little bit? What are some of your biggest problems as you're trying to do this really important work? Um, well, you know, as as it relates to brilliant young people, I think the um, it's it, and you know this we're in the middle of the sixth mass mass extinction, as you said. Um, there's a million um, horrible things happening and tons and tons of bad news, and it's really easy to feel um, upset, scared, anxious, sort of depressed at the state of the planet and the, you know, the state of the planet that you all are inheriting, and even apathetic, uh, because what can one person do in the face of all these challenges? And so I think that that kind of disillusionment and apathy is a big deal. And there's parallels to teaching and the style of teaching and learning we do at Harbor School, because if you're not actively engaged in solution finding, like we're not going to find solutions. And so the, um, the big, um, so that's a big sort of cultural challenge in New York City and you know all around the world is finding ways to motivate people to move forward together. Because even if it's not, not n n none of us as individuals are going to solve the climate crisis. But unless every single person, unless communities all over the world act and behave differently, it's going to keep getting worse. And so, find, so it, it requires, like if you, if you imagine a future state where we've adapted to, the, to those changes and, and stopped causing these problems, everyone would be behaving much differently than they are today. You know, what our diet is, how we get around, all that stuff. And uh, so I think that one big challenge is finding the motivation to move forward instead of sort of be back on our heels. And that's another big, uh, you know, part of the reason Billion Oyster Project is designed the way it is, is to welcome all different types of people into restoring New York Harbor. So we work with public schools all over the city, we work with volunteers, we work in communities, you know, on the shoreline in all five boroughs, and we try to break down barriers to accessing the harbor, break down barriers to participating in community science, and to actually working to restore the ecology, because the, that act of being involved in a positive environmental work is incredibly motivating to many different types of people. And if you think about anything that you're good at, that you like, think of yourself as being good at, it's probably something you worked hard at and you know, tried to get better at. And so providing like, access to those experiences as it relates to nature creates a, um, just like a, a, a new sense of place in the world. And that's kind of um, how we're working to address that back on your heels mentality. But for us, other challenges, we're, we're always funding constrained. So we work as hard as we do to raise as much money as we can, and that's always a limiting factor. The nonprofit, fi nonprofit financing is completely broken. It's not an effective way to grow. Um, you know, if we were a for-profit business and we had demonstrated the success we have, demonstrated our ability to reach scale and the type of impact we want to have, all of which we have done, we'd be able to raise a big chunk of money to take us to the scale that we need to be at. But instead, every dollar we raise has to go to a specific program that we're implementing. And in our case, those programs are hard to do. They're hard to, you know, we don't know whether or not the oysters will survive in each individual place we put them. And so that makes it, it it's hard, it's very easy to be incredibly risk averse. 
in a nonprofit environment because you, you, you're, you're so dependent on those continued streams of funding. And um, so that's, that's a big challenge, is finding ways to kind of break that system and invest in solutions that work and allow them to come to scale, even if they don't have a, you know, any like, uh, revenue generating capacity. Like all of our programs are free for, free for schools, free for students, free for volunteers. And because of that, we don't have, no one's ever gonna make a lot of money working, investing in billion oyster projects. And that creates some challenges. <laughs> Right, it's just a really basic problem with that we, the things that are so important, we often don't value in the way that our systems are operating right now. Um, and I think it's really interesting that you as business students are thinking not just, you know, turn on investment, but like how do we expand what we're doing to ensure that we value some of the things that don't have value in the market, frankly. Mm. Like we destroy ecosystems, in order for many businesses to have made money, that was a cost that was imposed on society. And then how do we clean that up, literally, yep. is very, very hard. But we know we need to now for our future. Um, and so, you know, that's a really big challenge. I don't know if there would be any kind of social enterprise or any way that you could think of um, businesses that could, um, you know, you, you've talked about like how they can brand themselves, so at least mm. there's some value. Um, but are there any other ways you could see that, that people could develop businesses around some of this ecosystem restoration? Do you have other cases? Yeah, I mean, that, it's definitely not my area of expertise. There's, um, there are, I mean, you can look at the, the way the waterfront in New York City has changed over the last you know, 20 years, not even that long. Um, and the, um, well, I guess if we look back a little farther than that, um, sort of 50s and 60s, the, um, all the Section 8 housing, a lot of the Section 8 housing, affordable housing, is built on the waterfront. And that is a you know, signal that that is not a desirable place to live. That's why those, the affordable housing is put there. And now there's this huge shift where all these luxury condos are going on the waterfront. So that... That re represents many, many, many billions of dollars of investment in the in sort of real estate and that shifting landscape of the waterfront, and that's a result of the harbor being a, you know, a, a less off-putting place, and so now you know the, now the harbor is cleaner, and there's a better chance of seeing sea creatures there. Rich people want to live on the on the waterfront, and so that's sort of an example of the the impact that you know you don't see. It's not right in your face, but it's a it's a big it's a lot of uh, money going in that direction for that reason. Um, so there's those types of benefits that we work with developers now to restore oysters in front of new waterfront developments because the, that increases the having a restor restored ecosystem allows them to rent their units for, for more. So that's, a, that's another example. Um, and there are, um, there are definitely, you know, environmental engineering firms and um, that, that you know, work specifically with you know, sort of green infrastructure, and that's their line of business. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about the restaurants. How did you reach out? Are there just a certain number that are providing their shells to you, and do they also use that as like I'm a support of the Billion Oyster Project? Or? Yeah. Um, so we we right now we're working with 70 restaurants, mostly in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and um, the, the, it was a. We peaked at 85 before the pandemic, and now we've gotten back up to 70. And that allows us to get about 8,000 pounds of shell per week out of the, out of the waste stream. Um, and the restaurants, it's, it's all different at each different restaurant, but most of our restaurant partners like to brand themselves as having some sort of you know, environmental benefits or, or you know, being thoughtful about their environmental choices, and recycling shells is one way to do that. So the, some restaurants will put us on the menu or on the window outside, saying they collect all their shells, and um, yeah, and it's the restaurants do it. You know, we don't pay the restaurants for their shell; they do the extra work to separate them, which is not insignificant. And then we operate the truck that goes around and picks up the shells. That's really cool. Well, this is really amazing work. I would love to open it up now to questions. Um, I'm sure you have a lot. Uh, yeah, I'll start with. Uh, one of the gentlemen there. How about the far gentleman? And then we'll go to the side yet. 
Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Leo. I'm a sustainability management uh, student here at Columbia University. Um, and I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit on the link between oysters and climate change. Like, do oysters reduce uh, carbon emissions directly or indirectly, or how are they helping to yeah, reduce the consequences of climate change? Yeah, um, so I would um, personally, I think it's a mistake to look at downstream solutions for carbon emissions. The same as it's a mistake to look at, and everyone knows that oysters filter the water, but ultimately that's not the point. Because if you rely on a downstream solution, you're not fixing the problem. And so the um, oyster reefs, an oyster, a thriving oyster reef ecosystem, just like a thriving rainforest ecosystem, is carbon neutral. So the, because of all the organisms that are respiring in those places. So a growing oyster reef can act as a sink for carbon. So that there's a limited time window when that, where, where you're taking carbon out of, the, out of the atmosphere for that reason. And then if you had a thriving reef, it would be carbon neutral. And so I think that um, you know, oysters, do they can play a buffering role because they're calcium carbonates. They can reduce, you know, support ocean acidification or help counteract ocean acidification. The, a growing reef can be a sink for carbon. The, Oysters are not going to solve the problem. I think the biggest mistake we make in trying to solve the carbon crisis is looking for things outside of our own behavior to solve the problem. Because the number one cause, the number one most important thing is what we do with the choices we make every day. And that's 99% of the problem. So looking for these downstream solutions to solve, you know, that to like try to capture some of the carbon out of the atmosphere, I think that, I mean, there are people who are a lot smarter than me who have really great ideas for doing that, but unless we're all willing to, you know, make different decisions, it's not going to solve the problem. So it didn't really answer your question, maybe a little. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really interesting, right, that our water in New York City that we're so proud of is in part really clean because of the foresight of people who really protect the watershed um, in the Catskills. So to protect those forests, and the city continues to have partner, partners with farmers to protect the streams and the rivers that feed our, um, you know, our, uh, our reservoirs. Um, and so rather than polluting the water and then trying to clean it, they actually have the foresight, like you're saying, literally upstream to take care of the water system, and that is a much better way. There was a choice to install treatment plants yeah. um, and, you know, put chlorine put bleach in the water to keep it safe to drink, and or through eminent domain, buy up all the land around the reservoirs. And keep them as forests. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, but that's rather rare. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're in this, this problem of a, a lot of carbon in our atmosphere. So, yeah, got to stop pumping it into it. Um, yeah, so the lady over here. Um, I There's a microphone. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, well, I'm the founder of a micro philanthropy app that funds climate solutions. And actually, you guys are one of our few organizations on the platform. Thank um, you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, so I have a question. Do you ever think that New York will become like Copenhagen, where we'll be able to swim in the harbor and it'll be like clean enough for us to kind of enjoy it like that? Yes. Um, and um, so a couple things there. Um, the har most of the harbor is safe to swim in most of the time right now. So the, uh, and it's, it's a complicated story because we've been talking about water quality, we've been talking about sewage in the harbor, and that all sounds very off-putting. But at the same time, the, there's so much flushing in the harbor. We operate a water quality testing program at 75 sites throughout the estuary to look at bacteria that would make you sick if you went in the water. The same thing they use for opening and closing beaches. And the harbor, the whole harbor, if it was a beach, it would be open most days of the year. And just like there are beach closures when it rains a lot, the same thing would happen in the harbor. So changing that is a, is a huge, would, would make that, would bring us a lot closer to that reality of like, accessing the harbor regularly. Um, and it's absolutely within the power and resources that we have here in New York City to make that change. The problem is it's not, it's not enough of a priority. So the argument that the city of New York makes is that the people are more concerned with the cost of their water bills than they are with having a clean harbor. And that's the trade-off, because the DEP, the Department of Environmental Protection, 
manages the water coming in and the water coming out of New York City. And it costs them money to do a better job treating sewage than they're doing right now. And um, that money would be passed on to consumers. And the, you know, I think that if everyone in New York City knew that their untreated household wastewater went into the harbor every time it rained and knew that they could pay $5 more a year on their water bills to solve that problem, I think you'd see a big shift. But there's an awareness issue there that um, we're not clamoring for it. Like imagine if Central Park, <coughs> you went to take your family to Central Park one day and the gates were closed, it was full of trash and human waste. Like that would stop immediately. And you know the biggest open space in New York City, our most important natural resource, we're denied access to that on a regular basis because it's contaminated with human waste. That sh we shouldn't be okay with that. And if so, as soon as we decide as a community that we want that vision, then we have the capacity to 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 get there. And that's what we think about. Uh, that and I'm glad you asked that question because the whole Copenhagen or. Um, Oslo or you know, even Vancouver, there's all these examples of cities uh, in, on estuaries that have a different relationship with the water around them. And how cool would it be in the summertime in New York if everyone, you know, there were swimming piers in the Hudson River and everyone was jumping in the water and um, it would be amazing. And that's a, we, we can get there, um, but it's going to, we, we all have to decide together that's what we want. Let's start a campaign. <laughs> I swam to work today. Uh, not today, this uh, about a month ago. <laughs> That's cool. Wonderful. We've got uh, another gentleman on this side, I think. Oh. Hey, hi, uh, this is Desi again from Sustainability Management Program. Uh, you pointed out that you know oyster reefs can uh, break the uh, waves and protecting the shore. And there was this project from City, like $119 billion to build sea walls. So do they have like do they think about this as an alternative or do they do you, did you get a buy-in from for this you know natural based solution? Right. So the um, the uh, you know you can't have one or the other. You can't have you know strictly green solutions are strictly gray solutions for the challenge of rising water levels and more intense storms in New York City. So it has to be a combination. Um, and it depends on what you're, are you trying to keep all the water out all the time? Are you trying, you know, are you trying to accept some water into the city and change how, what buildings look like? The, there's, you know, few places in the world that stand to lose more from rising water levels and there's few places in the world where the scale of the intervention that's necessary is as high as it is in New York City. So I think it has to be a combination of sort of big gray solutions and, and nature-based solutions. And it depends on where you are. So example, lower Manhattan, the, the water moves very fast. It's very deep around, around lower Manhattan. You could never protect lower Manhattan with oyster reefs. So that's, but you know, where, you know, all of Jamaica Bay, a lot of the Brooklyn shoreline, Staten Island, the Jersey shoreline, there's places where oyster reefs can play a really important role there. So I think it has to be a combination of the two. And what we're advocating for with those plans is to have, you know, the share that goes to nature-based solutions be greater than, you know, it's originally pro proposed at. And there was a lot of advocacy to get to that point. Because right. before there was a plan for giant storm barriers, and now that's no longer the main plan. So um, interesting question. I, I think there was another a, a lady back there. Great questions, by the way. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Sylvia from the Business School. So I was wondering if there was a person who was also trying to do a, a project or a non-for-profit with a similar purpose, maybe other geography, other type of ecosystem. Um, what are what are the, the the streams of funding? How how do they classify, so to say? What is most important? Where do you spend most of your energy in? Is it like marketing the um, like the courses for like corporates, or is it finding partners? Is it getting grants? How does that work? Most of our funding comes from grants. So the um, it's split roughly three ways between um, government grants, private foundation grants, and individuals, events, and corporations. In the three relatively equal parts. So, so government grants and, and grants from private foundations are the, that's the, um, that's kind of, you know, that's like our core funding. That's what you can rely on year over year. 
And so we spend a lot of time looking for grant opportunities and applying, you know, writing grant applications to various public agencies and um, private foundations. A lot of work. Um, the gentleman here. Um, so I grew up in Florida. I've been diving since I was 12, and I had friends that went into work related to coral propagation, and it sounds very similar in a lot of ways. Um, I'm curious if you have to do anything similar to like they're trying to do um, genetic propagation for heat tolerance and stuff like that. And so there's a balance between dealing with the upstream and then also dealing with you have plummeting biodiversity, so you have to do something. So you're doing similar things of like how do you get to sustainable growth? that will keep going even if you stopped. Yeah, so the, um, the, uh, the biggest difference between coral restoration and oyster restoration is that we're, we're dealing with one species. So the, and with coral you usually have a, a variety of species and the, the interaction between those. Um, so the, the one species of oyster, the native East Coast oyster, thrives from Newfoundland to, La to Mexico, which is a huge temperature range. And so the, um, it's not going to be too hot for oysters to live in New York City for a very, very long time. Um, and the, there are some really interesting questions around genetic bottlenecking and inbreeding suppression that happen when you're using hatchery-raised oysters. So what we try to do is, when we can use local oysters as our brood stock, you're always going to be, um, whenever you uh, get any <laughs> Especially oysters, or I'm sure with coral, though I'm not an expert there, but the, you're always going to limit genetic diversity when you're farming anything um, in that way. And so the, we try by using different brood stock, and also um, there are remnant oyster populations that still exist up in the Hudson River and the western Long Island Sound and, and other places. And then, so we're, we're trying to build structures that allow those populations to grow and um, sort of come down the river. The, uh, sustain the number one indicator of a sustainable oyster population is recruitment. So we look at, after that larval stage, oysters show up every summer on the shoreline in New York City and in different places. And they're not arriving in a, uh, at a density that allows those populations to grow, but they show up everywhere. And so, what you, I mean, what you're looking for is, a, you know, one to 200 animals per meter squared. And what we have are like one to 50, depending on where you are. And uh, so what we do is every year we, through shoreline surveys, we monitor the natural recruitment that happens in the harbor, some of which are the offspring from the oysters we've restored, and some of which are offspring from uh, these remnant populations. And what we've seen over the last 15 years is a gradual increase in the, um, the number of recruitment events and the density of oysters we see. And so we take that as good evidence that if we continue doing this, we'll get to the point where we reach that sort of critical turning point where the population grows. But once you get there, what, what you get is a situation like you have in Charleston Harbor or Tampa Bay, where every structure is covered with live oysters, but the bottom, that's all mud, is still doesn't have its oyster reef. So we want to get the population to a point where any rock you put in the water gets covered with oysters um, every summer. And so that's sort of what we're looking for, is that increase to the point where we can stop putting live oysters in the water, and we just have to put substrate in the water. What does that graph look like? Are you like, can you project if at the current rate that you'd hit that point? Where it's, it's it's stochastic. It's all over the place. It's all so, over the place. So the, okay. and there's, you know, it's it's not well enough understood. So we look, we monitor the water to find out when oyster larvae are in the water. We look at the shoreline to see when they show up on the shoreline. But there are some weird things happening that we can't explain. So at, at one of those weird things is that the the best recruitment year we had in the last few years was also the best recruitment year all the way down the Jersey shore. Hmm. And so that has nothing to do with the oysters we put in New York Harbor, but some other sort of macro environmental condition that allowed that. And it's the same with blue crabs. You see when the Chesapeake Bay has a banner year for blue crabs, so does Long Island Sound. And I don't know anyone who knows why that is. Hmm. Um, and then there, so there's, there are these sort of uh, very localized influences and then also these kind of bigger picture things that are going on. But so what it looks like is we'll have a year where we don't have any recruitment. And then we'll have three years in a row where we have, each year we have more. And then a year where we don't have any. So it's, it's, it's hard to um, understand what that relationship is. Really interesting. I think we have more questions. 
Uh, yes, please. Hi, um, I'm Crystal from um, studying at Columbia SIPA. Uh, when you mentioned that the public, uh, I mean, non for profit financing is not working, um, I kind of uh, can relate to you because I was a treasurer of a uh, non for profit that my friend had founded and where we heavily um, rely on the donor and the grants, and it's uh, mostly not very predictable for like the next year. So it's like when you plan your project, you can only go like one or two years, you can only plan it because you don't know how much money you're going to getting it. So my question for you, but like I was also thinking maybe it was, um, maybe the money is out there and there are people willing to give um, you money, but it's a matter of you identifying and like writing those grants um, applications and stuff. Do you, I don't know if you agree with that. And second question would be, what what's the need or what do you think would help you as a non profit to have a sustainable like funding system or how you can operate your uh, your uh, projects? Yeah, um, so I definitely think the money's out there, um, and the uh, and, and it's a lot of it's going to philanthropy, right? So the the and it's a very competitive environment, and so we you know do what we can to access it. Um, so I think that uh, nonprofit development teams are the experts in how to access and how to access the existing funding that's out there. Um, often they're resource constrained. And so as an example, um, you know, I, I think in, innovative strategies to funding are, is what is needed. Because there's a lot of uh, constraints put, you know, there's a lot of oversight and constraints put on dollars that come into nonprofits. That makes it very hard to administer those grants and stay competitive in different, um, different uh, settings. Our, our intervention is very unique in that it crosses these two, you know, environment and education. So there's very few, you know, we don't fit very well into anyone's buckets. Because if we were just working on public education, we'd be, we would be more efficient at our public education intervention if we were just working at environmental restoration, we'd be more efficient at that. It turns out that it's harder to train teenagers to restore the environment than it is to restore the environment, right? But that's our whole thing. That's, we think it's much more important to do it that way. And the sort of the long-term outcomes for the natural world require that style of work. So we rely on, on foundations that are willing to be, to give us, the, to, to be innovative, to say, okay, I understand that it's going to cost you a, a million dollars to restore an, acres of, an acre of oyster reef, whereas they're doing the Chesapeake for a quarter million dollars because you're doing it in this way, and that's more important. So where if I'm the private foundation, you know, a national private foundation, I can say, well, I can restore four acres in the Chesapeake or one acre in, in New York Harbor. Why would I do New York Harbor? You need to be able to take that leap and say, I understand that why you're doing it that way is more important, so we're willing to, you know, give you a break on the metrics to invest in this, in this type of work. Um, an, another example is we had a, a, a board member. Right? When, when we were a million-dollar-a-year nonprofit, we had a board member, and it was you know paycheck to paycheck, super stressful. You know, every, every two weeks, how are we going to have enough money to make payroll? And we had a board member who was, looked at that and said, "Listen, I'm going to give you two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year for four four years. You can use it for whatever you want." And that was such a huge deal for just allowing us to take our foot off the gas a little bit and say, well, "How do we build the capacity we need?" And so we were able to invest in our development team and build the, you know, and sort of level up our fundraising. And now, you know, four years later, we're a $6 million a year nonprofit. We have these sort of more consistent revenue streams that we can count on. And, uh, but, you know, I don't know if we would be here without that one person saying, like, you need to, like, this is not a sustainable model. You, you, we need, like, what do you need in order to change and sort of break away from that? style of fundraising. Since you raised the point of what do you need, I am curious, so what, what do you need? What's the magnitude of the funding to get to a billion oysters? <laughs> so where we're... And people swimming. <laughs> yeah. The, um, we're, you know, we'll, we'll be able, our goal is 2035, um, by 2035, one billion oysters, and we're trying to engage one million people in restoring one billion oysters, so that's the sort of double sides of that. Um, and we need to think that in order to, we need to grow our, our annual operating budget to the 10 to $12 million range. 
and have the team around that in order to reach that goal. And that's the that's what we're working towards. So, so double, sort of double where yeah. you're at. Hmm, that seems doable. <laughs> Hard, but doable. That's actually. I mean, I'm not worried. I think we'll do it. Like, yeah, of course. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That is totally amazing. So if you if we didn't, you know, there'd be really hard to be involved in this type of work if you didn't think it was going to be possible. For sure. Yeah. Activists must be optimists, as one of my friends says. Um, are there any other questions or comments or thoughts? Uh, yes. Yeah. I'm curious how transportation plays a role. For the like, recording. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm curious how, like you mentioned, barriers to access, um, like getting people more involved with the harbors. And I'm wondering how you think about some of the things that are like more macro and harder to change, like transportation, like the fact that highways are already a lot, like the reason you can't get to a lot of the water, um, and how, I guess, how your team thinks about that challenge um, as part of like the long-term vision for New York and getting people closer to the water. Yeah, so the um, access, access to natural space in New York City is not fairly distributed, right? And so if you look at where the highways are, where the parks are, you know, look at, you know, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights has the has Brooklyn Bridge Park. The entire uh, Manhattan side of the Harlem River is a park. The entire Bronx side is a rail, railway. Um, and that's true all throughout the city. Riverside Park is a great example. Hudson River Park right here. The more affluent communities, the more affluent a community is and the whiter the community is, the more likely they are to have access to the waterfront. So what we do is we target our intervention in other places. And we try to understand what are the barriers to access. And sometimes it's transportation and figuring out buses for schools makes a big difference. Sometimes it's who controls the land. There's a lot of parks concessions that are operated by these people who we love, these sort of weird canoe clubs and whatnot, and they're not, you know, they're not representative of the communities that are live adjacent to those pieces of land. So how do you break down barriers to access? You know, does it mean having more community programs? Does it mean putting signs up outside saying, you know, every Thursday is free kayaking, um, going into schools and, and making the local students aware of that, doing training at the site to sort of identify the the intrinsic barriers to people who look different from you coming through your place and how we can help educate this, you know, largely senior citizen white population to be more welcoming. I mean, that's a big part of what we do. And the, um, so we, we've created this, one example of that is a safe space commitment. So we ask that all of our partners sign a safe space commitment and basically describes what it means to be a safe, welcoming place, you know, open place or indoor place in New York City. And what we found is that just the act of signing your organization up for something that requires a high enough level conversation at the organization to get the wheels moving. And we see some, we have an organization that's not willing to sign onto a safe space agreement, doesn't share our values of creating safe welcoming space, we'll work with somebody else. And then it starts with agreeing that those are shared values and then understanding when we're not living up to the values and, and being willing to have those conversations. So like, you know, our, you know, the, the, the whatever, there's a million, there's a million examples, but the, um, those barriers to access are just as real as fences and need to be, you know, a, a addressed and broken down. But it's primarily through conversation, I think. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really important point about um, environmental justice and how it comes in, um, you know, in your work. Uh, and it sounds like you're very explicitly thinking about these um, unsupported communities, historically marginalized communities, like the South Bronx and other places um, in your work. And so that's really, really interesting to see. Right. I mean, if, if you accept that access and connection with nature is an essential component of building environmentalists, <laughs> which I do. I think that that's every, every person I know who works in this space has some form of experience in the natural world that helps shape their environmental ethic. So if you accept that as a reality and accept the reality that, that, that access to those resources is unfairly distributed, there's no way you can do this work without also trying to address that. And knowing that we need everybody on our team, like not addressing it, you're going to have a, you know, insufficient intervention. Yeah, there's clear demand. Uh, I do some work with South Bronx Unite, and they're really trying to build uh, 
waterfront parks for their community from former industrial land that's yep. really underutilized. So there's a, there is demand from within these communities clearly for this kind of work. So uh, I think it's thank you for for raising it. Very very important question. Um, yes. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm David Polk. I'm a second year MBA here. Uh, what are your favorite oysters to eat? <laughs> and if we are oyster lovers and we're going to order some, is there something we should be aware of? Like, are there unsustainable oysters or are they all farmed or et cetera? Great questions. So the, um, I love eating oysters and I eat a lot of oysters. And that's one of the big perks of my job is that we, we do a lot of, because we, 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 uh, we're riding the oyster wave, just like all these restaurants are and all these oyster farms are. And interest and enthusiasm for oysters is a good business for us. And so we do a lot of events with oysters. We work with restaurants and farms. And, um, but the uh, things you should be aware of as a consumer, so almost all the oysters in the marketplace are farmed. You can also find wild oysters. I would, I, I, as a general rule, I don't think we should be eating any wild animals. But the w wild oysters are coming off of existing reefs, whereas farmed oysters are, every oyster farm is an oyster reef that's maintained by a farmer because someone's eating the oysters. So, so eating farmed oysters is one of the most positive things you can do for the environment. So if you're into oysters, you should congratulate yourself on uh, helping restore nature in these beautiful places. So I'd say farmed oysters always, local oysters are way, way better than oysters that spend time on planes. Uh, fresh oysters, so as a consumer, this is more of like a, your consumer experience, you should be aware of when those oysters came out of the water, and you shouldn't uh, eat oysters that have been out of the water for more than a week. Um, and you can find oysters in New York City that have been out of the water for three weeks, and you have a right to know when they've come out of the water. Um, and the other way to do that is to eat oysters at places that go through a lot of oysters, so because then they're always um, going through them. Um, eat at restaurants that are participating in our shell collection program, which you can see on our website. Those are um, those restaurants are saving their shells. Um, you screen them. Well, we screen them. Um, that's our primary screen. Can we collect your shells? <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the, we don't, we don't, and it's interesting we've been sort of thinking about this, but we don't, uh, we educate our restaurant partners on what it means to be part of Billion Oyster Project, what we're doing. We don't um, um, educate restaurants on how to prepare their food. And I think that there is, there, there could be uh, something there because I think that. Oysters are one of the few things that you can get at a fancy restaurant that are like, not, not well presented and not well taken care of. I mean, you, there's such an incredible attention to detail to everything that goes on a plate. And then you'll get a dozen oysters that have been out of the water for three weeks and have been all chopped up before they get to you. <laughs> um, so I think that and, um, you know, restaurants want to know if they're not providing you the experience you are expecting. So as much as I'm not someone who ever sends food back, but it's I think it helps to, to say like these, you know, are not, I was expecting fresh oysters, um, much as I hate saying that, but the, um, yeah, but we don't screen for the experience of the diners. We rely on the restaurants for that. Yeah, please. Actually, I just have a question in that vein. Um, do you think there will ever be agricultural value to some of the oyster reefs that you're building? Um, so I think you could, you know, the, the closest oyster farms to New York City are in Barnegat Bay and in Bridgeport. Um, so that once, in, any closer to New York City, the water quality isn't good enough to have reliable harvest or legal harvest. So I think there is, it is possible that you could get to a point where you could, where you could harvest oysters from New York, from New York Harbor. Um, all of our oysters are, are, uh, they go on the bottom as a reef, so they're not um, sort of suspended and, and maintained the way you would a farm. So if the water quality in New York City got clean enough to allow for harvest, then you could start an oyster farm here. One of the coolest things about oysters and oyster farms is that they're all in these really sort of magical, beautiful, natural places. And so I don't know that it would ever really make sense because you're, you, know, you don't want to eat oysters out of somewhere that's just barely clean enough. You know? So I don't know. I mean, I think that it's possible. 
Wow. Well, this has been a really fabulous conversation. I don't know if there's any last questions or comments, but the questions have been really, really good. Thank you for having me, and thank you for all the good questions. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to leave us with? Yeah. yeah. All right.